Good Friday, everyone. Welcome to the VolQuest.com podcast with Jesse Simonton, Austin Price, and Rob Lewis. I'm Brent Hubs. We hope everybody had a terrific Thanksgiving. Uh, Tennessee obviously uh, getting set to take on Vanderbilt tomorrow. The Volunteers trying to get to 7-5 and five in a remarkable turnaround for this team and maybe improve their bowl stock. We'll get into bowl talk in just a little bit. We'll get into some hoops talk. We'll get into some recruiting talk as well. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the, the matchup in, in this football game. Rob Vanderbilt's not – there's not, just not, not a whole good. lot that, that jumps out at you that, that kind of scares you. Weather might be the bigger concern neutralizer for Tennessee if it does indeed rain. But when you look at Vanderbilt across the board, um, it, it's hard to see them – you know, being able to play with Tennessee if Tennessee plays their best and don't turn, don't turn it over. I mean, they're, they're just a bad, bad football team. Um, nobody, even Arkansas averages 300 yards of offense. And, and this isn't SEC games, just, you know, this deep in the season. I just look at the conference stats. Vandy, Vandy averages 246. And that's, I mean, that's unbelievably bad. I mean, that, that's, I mean, I'd, I'd have to look it up. It may be historically bad to not average 250 a game in SEC play, and I mean, I mean, you're, I mean, it can get ugly. I mean, there can be turnovers if, if if there's bad weather, but I mean, there's, as Jesse has pointed out, I mean, Tennessee's a three touchdown favorite. I mean, the only time Jeremy Pruitt's been favored over an SEC team in, in, in two years that he's been here, which is a pretty bold statement about Vanderbilt. Is, is there? I mean, look, everybody's going to assume Tennessee's going to win. We know how Tennessee can lose if you turn the football over. Don't show up. Get some rain. Is is there a matchup concern that Tennessee should have in this game or does have in this game? Uh, I mean, Vander, I mean Vanderbilt has. It's it's funny because they do have some playmakers, but it's just been a struggle and a slog to get them the ball. I mean, to Rob's point about the stats, they they rank 121st in the country um, in yards per play. The only team in the SEC that don't have that doesn't have, excuse me, uh, at least five yards per play. I mean. You know, the, the guy that AP and I covered in recruiting, Cam Johnson's pretty good. He's been decent for them. Mm -hmm. He is. But he's about their best receiver right now because Lipsicum's, you know, dinged up. They haven't probably got what they thought of out of Pinckney this year. That's probably been the biggest disappointment. The tight end came into the season. He's an NFL body. He's an he, NFL player. And he was a lot better last year than he was this year. But that all could go to the back. They don't have anybody who's throwing these guys right. the ball. And that's the problem when you're, so you know, bad. Neil and Wallace and – I forget the other kid's name, uh, the freshman or the junior who's played just a little bit. I mean, it's really been Neil and Wallace, but I, I don't. You go down. I think Tennessee's got an advantage all the every single matchup, including you know just the X factor or whatever. That Tennessee's not only the better team and has something to play for, but this is a team that wants the Jawan Jenningses and the Callaways and the Batulis do not want to end their career have, having never beaten Vanderbilt. That's all, that's unthinkable. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to think that Tennessee would not be ready to play when, when, when Jesse makes that statement, Austin, about, you know, could go down and not, not beat Vanderbilt in your Tennessee career. Juwan Jennings is from Nashville. We know how, how, how bothered by the fact and he that he did his freshman year because he's a fifth year. Yeah, but, but I mean, like, he, didn't, he, but, he wasn't even but playing. But, you know, the, the four year seniors don't want to go out on, you know, going 0 for 4 against Vanderbilt. You would think Tennessee's motivated to play is my point. Oh, I 100% agree. And, and I think the coaching staff this week, and in fact, in talking to some people, I think they've played up every comment that was made after the, even, you know, the previous seasons, you know. you know, This is our state. You know, the, I look back on Twitter the other night, and Jesse, I know, Jesse's got a tweet from someone, 2016, a video of him yelling, this is our state. Someone I mean, popped like, it up. I think that stuff's kind of been played on loop in the football complex this week. I, I think Tennessee's going to come in. And, and fired up. Um, I think Tennessee's going to want to end this thing and, and ride off into what they hope is a Florida Bowl game in style. And, uh, you know, I expect them to, you know, I, Jeremy keeps talking about, you know, we haven't played our best game. I think you're always, even when you play the, a really good game, I think you're, you know, hoping for more, you know, so I don't think there is a best game, so to speak. But I do think Tennessee could potentially play the best they've played. Um, you know, Saturday against Vanderbilt, as you said, you know, is not very good on offense. And, and you know, this is a Tennessee defense that has, continues to improve under uh, Jeremy Pruitt and Derek Hansley. Don't, don't you think that it's important, Rob, for Tennessee? If Tennessee wants to continue to show growth, it's not just about winning this game. It's taking, it's taking control of the game early. You know, they, they didn't do that in Kentucky. 
they really didn't do that at, at Missouri. Um, I mean, you, you know, they're down with a minute and a half to go in the first half. I mean, this is an opportunity for, you know, when you talk about growing and developing, continue to get better, here's a chance for Tennessee to, to take to take full control of a football game early and put it away early. I, I think that's a next, you know, against an inferior opponent, that's what Tennessee needs yeah, to do. I, mean, I think it's important. I, I completely agree. I and mean, would you say, that, I mean, they've not really done, they've not, you know, despite winning four SEC games, they haven't done that this year. I guess maybe Kentucky last year. Yeah, they were controlling I mean, that game. Probably the only time way. that it's happened in two years. So, I mean, I, I think that's a really fair point to, you know, to show growth, to, to take the next step is to just go out and put it on, a, you know, Put it away in the first half. I mean, I think Tennessee's capable of doing that against this this particular Vanderbilt. Yeah, because you know, if you get up on them early, Vanderbilt ain't coming out for the second half. I mean, that group's ready to be done. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I do. I, I mean, I think Missouri had some fight in them because their defensive lines. And they still hadn't heard back on the were, appeal. And they were still in the game, you know. So if you if you take them out of a game, if you take Vanderbilt out, I'm not sure how much Vanderbilt's got left in the tank emotionally, mentally, to play. And Kelly Bryant was a guy last – I mean, he's won a lot. He's got, he's got some pride there. And there's some other guys on that Missouri team. Roundtree, I mean – and and that, if you turn – there's individual matchups for Tennessee and, and why you also – you know, Vaughn ran all over them last year. Roundtree ran all over them the previous two years. Tennessee held him to 2.7 yards per carry. You know, there, there's – Tiny bits of mo- motivation, I think, that Tennessee can also use. That also <laughs> you can just give. They already have the advantage down the line, talent-wise, and everything else. But the fact that you know that they've lost by double digits to Vandy. It's not even just that they've lost. They've lost by double digits the last yeah. three years. Uh, so I, I, I don't. You know, I've joked. I've said you know, fifty burger a couple times. With the weather, I don't know about that. But I could totally, you know, and we'll have our our, our picks come out later this afternoon. I would. It would not surprise me at all if we see something like a thirty-eight to nothing just shellacking. Yeah, where Tennessee controls the whole way would would make sense. Now, you can't turn it over. All those things that that we talked about, you got to you got to take advantage of that. I, I want to ask a couple things about this team before we jump into some recruiting and, and hoops and a little bowl talk and everything else. I, I've had this question asked to me a couple of different times this week. I think it's a really interesting question. We all know that Jerry Garantano is a, is a really good story, okay? The mental toughness, the physical toughness. But the question has been asking me, why? How did he turn this around? I mean, wh- what, is it that, what is it that suddenly he, quote, figured out or whatever the case may be? Is this a case where he was getting too much praise and hype in the preseason, couldn't handle it mentally, and, and he, you know, he needed to, to be the in the underdog role? I mean, why is this guy – and I don't know if there is an answer to this question. There's, um, I guess, some theories out there. But why would why would this guy find his way following the Alabama game the way that he has found it? Is, is it as simple as just watching the game from the sidelines? I mean, like seeing you know seeing the mistakes that you made. You you go back and watch the film, okay? But then all of a sudden you see how quick you know you know Brian Mallory gets it out of his hands. You know, even if Brian's making some bad reads and not putting him in the right run protection and all that stuff. The quick, how quick he gets out of it. Because, I mean, you go back to Saturday, I watched Jarrett two or three times on some slow-mo replays. You know, even one, get it out of his hands really quick, even if it wasn't a great ball by him. I mean, he got it out of his hands and gave it, you know, give his guy a chance to get it. Or, honestly, like, peeled his eyes back in his head to watch the rush. You know, I mean, like, it, it just seemed like he was processing things quicker than he was earlier in the year. I mean, I don't, I don't know what the answer is. I, I, I suspect that part of it has to do with, like, hitting rock bottom. You know, being a red shirt, you know, being in the fourth year of your program, returning starter, losing your job to a true freshman, you know, having every you know, all the fallout of, from Alabama. I mean, I, I would I would suspect that you know reaching that kind of low and and having enough pride to try to figure out how to dig himself out. That's I mean that, that's kind of what I, I see from the outside looking in. Yeah, I'm 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 in agreement with Rob on that. I mean, I I just. Th- we clearly don't have an answer. No, um, I mean, there's and, not an answer. And, and, I, and I'm not sure we'll even come close to getting one until maybe after the season, perhaps around spring practice, when Jarrett himself has had some time to really reflect. I mean, you know, AP and I talked about this leaving Missouri. It was strange. Jarrett talked about this being his last opportunity and, and last big chance, you know, because he did get to start for the first time since the Florida game. And yet this is a guy who had some – you know, he was. You know, he had been up, been up, been up, up on the podium a couple of times after the. You know, some other wins when he kind of played the role of savior. You know, super sub, whatever. And yet he chose not to kind of 
delve into the death threats and the and the adversity that he you know um, has gone through, but waited and. I think he is in himself still processing kind of how this has all both transpired to hitting rock bottom when he was received, when his head coach was up there at SEC Media Days pounding the table about how this is his guy versus what happened in the middle of the season versus where we are now, which everyone is very excited, it seems like, the fact that he wants to return to this football team in 2020. It was kind of strange that he waited till after he started a game and won a game to go down the road and kind of open himself up to stuff. I mean, it, it's almost like he didn't view himself as being, I don't want to say bat, but having, you know, taken the reins again, you know, being the guy until or maybe he, didn't he was see the himself, guy for 60 minutes. Or maybe he didn't see himself as a, you know, he saw himself as a part of the program, but not a future in the program. Maybe, I don't know. I, I just, it was a question asked to me and I didn't have an answer, you know, it was, it, we get it, it's a great story, but why, why did the story happen? Why does it happen this way? What has he found within himself? What's Jim Chaney found? Where, where have they found ground to make this thing work the way they have? I, I don't know the answer to it, but it's obviously worked uh, to, to the degree that, that Tennessee's got a chance to win seven games, which is highly and remarkable. Say, I mean, just based on like the last you know, three, maybe four games, outside of Joe Burrow, who's, with two are out now, who's, better, who's playing better than Jared in the SEC? You know, and it's it's it, you're right. But when you look at production and you look at you know critical throws, he still has a moment. I mean, he had the one drive where he airmailed three balls. You, you know, and you're like, oh, it's still there. But then he comes back the next drive and, and he throws you know just a couple of darts, Jesse. And you know his third down numbers are are crazy. I mean, it, you know, it, it's like it's, it's like he it's almost like from a mental standpoint, he needs to be back against the wall all the time. And maybe that's why he got out because but maybe that's why he got out of the funk. He he had a hard time handling being the front runner, being the guy, being anointed the guy without having to win the job. Because throughout his career, third and long has been the better play for him than second and short when he's throwing the football. And that's been the case again this year. So it's almost like the greater the pressure or, or that type of thing, it seems like he seems to be a little bit more focused and a little bit more dialed in. I don't know. but and, and I will say this, too. I mean, Saturday was the first time, as well as Jarrett played as this sub, you know, six-man guy. Saturday was the first time that Jim Chaney really said, I trust this guy. Yeah, go win the game. Because if you look at just the, the amount of attempts he had in some of those other games, I mean, they were like max protection. Let's this manage. Is, yeah, this is – you got – Two, you got you're throwing either Juwan here or Callaway deep here, and, and to Jarrett's credit, he started hitting those passes that he was not making earlier in the season. But Saturday, I mean, they did all of it from throws between the numbers to the fades to the deep digs, and and so if he can continue that, not only you know versus Vanderbilt, but in the bowl game and the next season, Tennessee's going to have one of the the better quarterback rooms or one of the better quarterbacks heading into the 2020 season. You know, and that's and Jesse brings up a good point because I mean everybody wants to talk about the difference between Jarrett in September and Jarrett now, but to me, it all, you could also talk about the difference between the way Jim Chaney called the game against Mississippi State with Jarrett in the game and the way he called it the last few weeks because he came off the bench of Kentucky, whoosh 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 right down the field, sound effects are free on the podcast, and then of course Saturday, whoosh whoosh whoosh. 415 yards. Mississippi State, I mean, <laughs> they, they didn't really trust him to put the ball in the air at but all. But the one difference in Mississippi State is they had to lead. It was try to manage and get to the house. We think we don't think they're, they're offensively State's going to score. We've got to lead. We want to be – now, they, they had to make a play at the end, and he, and he makes the, the throw to Tyler Bird to put it away. But there was a real thought, I think, of, hey, let's go win a shell and, and let's – Let's not do anything dumb offensively and let the defense win us for it. Kentucky, you're down 10 at the half. you got to score. So, and so, you knew you were going to get limited possession. Right, so your mindset had to be different against Kentucky. Now, to your point uh, about turning them loose, Missouri, clearly it was a different thought process and a different game plan from the get-go. It was, hey, we're going to wing it. We're going to go make plays. We're going to attack guys down the field. And the Kentucky game was also one week after Jarrett – he was he was seeing some ghosts and was getting hit a bunch against UAB and he had the bad intercept. You know he was not particularly sharp in that game. Right. So for him to bounce back the last two games has been very encouraging. All right. Before we get into recruiting, last thing about the football team, Rob, you've seen a lot of wide receivers at Tennessee through the years. We've never seen three have a hundred yards in a single game. 
Where do you put that that tr the the? But I won't say trio because Josh Palmer's still learning. But where do you put Callaway and Jennings and kind of Tennessee lore or Tennessee history okay. as a tandem? Yeah, as a tandem. I mean, you got Hunter, you got Rogers, who were both nearly thousand yard receivers under Jim Chaney. You got Pickens and Harper. You know, th those are probably two of the more productive tandems that come out. Washington and Stallworth. Yeah, Washington Stallworth. Great. That's a great point. I mean, Stallworth missed part of that year, but you're, when they came back, they were really good. Austin Rogers, Lucas Taylor, Josh Briscoe. That's a hell of a trio <laughs> right there. When, when, seriously, when you look at Callaway and Jennings, where do you put them? I'd put, I mean, in terms of production, I'd have to look at the numbers, but uh, I mean, I, I'd probably have to rank them you know, talent-wise below, you know, Harper and Pickens, obviously, and below uh, Washington and Stallworth. But I mean, they're they're right there in that conversation. I mean, it's pretty impressive. Yeah. I mean, you know, Jennings is having a great year, but Callaway. Callaway's at what for the year? Um, I know J Jawan is. Callaway has 600 yards. For okay, season. 600. And, and, of course, went through that early yeah, season I was about, what, still over 20, over 20 a catch. Yeah, yeah. And, that, and that's what he, he's going to end up. He's going to end his career with just, you know. Stupid. He averaged 17 as a fresh or 17 as a sophomore. 16 last year and now 21-3, which leads the SEC. This yeah, year. And, and so you got Jawan's 114 away from 1,000, be the first fall since 112 to do that. He can be the first fall since Malone to get to 10 touchdowns if he gets what? They need two more, so he got eight, you know. Then, of course, that don't count as running touchdown. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, he's had a phenomenal year. Of course, he's got two games to do that. But, I mean, I think, it, per, you know, he's got a real shot Saturday. Well, I, I think so. Providing the rain does not – interfere too much I, I, I don't I don't I mean from a production standpoint I, I mean talent okay I think Derek Rogers and Justin Hunter are probably more talented than those two guys maybe I, I, I mean I think that's a debatable deal I do think Pickens and Harper are more talented okay um, you know Stallworth and Washington probably there but from a production standpoint man I mean these guys have been have been really have been really good and, and really fun to watch you throw in where Palmer's at I mean this, I think this, what we saw Saturday night, is what Jim Chaney thought he was going to get at Georgia State and, and against oh, I BYU. I mean, I, mean, I think this that is Hunter's where they I, I just look at the Hunter-Patterson the Hunter -Patterson tandem was, yeah. was good Cordero. in 12. You forget about Cordero. Cordero yeah, for 12. A it's because Cordero's in the NFL and still can't run around. He couldn't but that run around year, But that year, year, I just checked because I was like, man, that, that was the year Bray was throwing it around. That year, Hunter had 1,000 yards, nine touchdowns, and Patterson just – we know what he can do with some of those reverses and, and whatnot, but he had almost 50 catches, about 800 yards, five touchdowns, average 17 good. catch. I mean, that, that, those, are, those are two pretty dynamic receivers. Michael Rivera in that group, too. Yeah. That was, and, mean, that was his, and that was the best season a tight end's ever had under Jim Chan. Yeah, and then South Sincere runs yeah, it I all. I think just from a pure athlete standpoint, I don't know if I've seen – I don't think I've seen anybody better than Cordell. No, from an athletic Just deal? pure yeah. athlete. No. Just pure athlete. I mean, that, that, he, is the, he is the one guy who could have – Wherever you handed him the ball on the field, you thought he had a chance to score. Whether it was 99 yards away from the end zone, whether it was a yard away from the end zone, you thought if he got the ball in his hands, he had a chance. Now, if you tell him to get on the board and draw routes, he couldn't, which is why he's not. That's why he's he, covering well, kicks. That's why he's I mean, covering kicks and trying to return <laughs> kicks to live in the National Football League. But ball in hand. And he was tough to tackle. His, oh, that, he that, was that was, so physical. His one season at Tennessee, these stats are absurd. I mean, just. Because he literally played one year of college football. I mean, he he had a kickoff return touchdown, averaged twenty eight yards. I mean, that's in in this day and age, that's still that's really good. I mean, that's, that's probably right. leading close to leading the league. He had a pet. He had one completion, one for one for thirty yards. He had a punt return touchdown, averaged twenty five yards a punt return, averaged twelve yards every time he touched the ball running the ball, which he had twenty five attempts. So it's not like he just got a couple three touchdowns. And then, like I said, I'm 800 yards receiving, five touchdowns. I mean, I mean that's a heck of a one. That's a one-hit wonder right there. And they could have easily had Cordero, well, Hunter, and and Derrick. I mean, Cordero's and, the and only Derrick guy. It up and had to I mean, go he's like back. that guy in high school. Like you just put the best athlete on the team at quarterback and have him run around. I mean, he right. was able to do that in the SEC. Right. I mean, just, and, uh, you know, which, look like that kid. Right. Which is crazy. And you're right. That could have. I mean, if you you did not. There's no way you'd had everybody happy if you'd had Patterson, Rogers. Hunter and Rivera, yeah, to try to get the ball to. I yeah. mean, that, that Dave Rick's one of the bigger wasted talents. Yeah, 
yeah, it's crazy. Here. Crazy. All right, that's a that's a sidebar. I wasn't planning on going down, but it is. Uh, you're right about Pat. He's got to be included in the tandem conversation for sure that year with Hunter. Let's jump to recruiting right quick. Talked a little bit about it on the podcast on Tuesday. Tennessee with some guys uh, coming in town on official visits, unofficial visits. Eric Kane had a story on the receiver uh, from down in Georgia who's going to come in. That's committed to Pittsburgh. What do you make of Tennessee's decision to offer him? Because again, we've talked a little bit about. You don't have to take one necessarily to take one, Austin, but here they are offering a guy um, late in the game here. Well, they are. I mean, you know, and, and you know, realistically, Brent, I, I think he's a good player. Um, but I think Tennessee's kind of exhausting all options when it comes to – Yeah, I mean, Jalen Barden, I mean, good-looking kid. Mm -hmm. Ramon Henderson, I think, is the guy that Tennessee really wants to get in here before the early signing date. You know, he, he's a – Is that the West Coast yeah, kid? Yeah, he's the West Coast kid. Okay. He's not been very many places. Um Notre you Dame, know, UCLA. Yeah, he's an Oklahoma kid that, you know, Oklahoma kind of filled up at his spot. You know, they liked him, but, you know, he was in no, no position at the time. And then by the time he was in position, they were full. Notre Dame likes him a lot. They would take this kid, snap of a finger. UCLA, same thing. Um, USC's not really gotten involved there. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, Tennessee has been kind of playing, you know, possum on this deal a little bit, you know, you know, recruiting him, but trying to do it under the radar, and uh, you know, because they don't want to draw attention to it. Kind of bring it in late, bring him in late. Yeah, so you can get him in. yeah, because he's not again not been very many places. So you come in here and you see the big stadium and all that stuff, and then you know, ten, ten, the one thing, in, uh, whether it be current coaches, previous staffs, whatever, uh, you know, or guys that just know about Tennessee, Tennessee puts on a really good show on an official visit. Mm -hmm. You know, they present well right. and. So that goes a long way. So if you can get a kid in here that's not been many places and is impressionable, the weekend before signing day, you may steal one. So, you know, that's one that, you know, we, t we had it in the war room last night. You know, that's one to watch. You know, now the question is, is does he ever make it in? You know, because he likes Notre Dame a good bit. Um, to me, that's Tennessee's biggest competition. Uh, with we'll be the at UCLA. Well, with the potential for week. UCLA, um, you know, as being the, the, uh, the other team that would be the competition for Tennessee. Um, you know, at this point. All right, other visits to note. That's well, you know, Vikeho not going to come in this weekend um, as of, uh, you know, as of Friday. Now, again, anything can change, but I think Tennessee ultimately wanted him to be able to maximize his time here. Didn't want to rush him in because he's going to play a high school game and then, you know, try to rush in, spend a few hours, and then, you know, fly back out for school. And that's the challenges with within season visits. Yeah, and that's the challenges with in season visits, especially in the playoffs. I mean, like, look, when, you, when you're in the regular season, if you're playing some cupcake, it's not a big deal. Um, but if you're in the playoffs and it's winter go home, then high school coaches don't want you missing any, you know, they don't want you missing any part of a, in the front end of a Monday practice. You're definitely not going to miss your game. You know, some schools practice on Sundays. Um, it just it's one of those things where I think that Tennessee would much rather him come in in December and be able to get the full treatment and not have to worry about rushing in and out and, and, and rushing the visit at all. But not falling down Tennessee's radar in any way? No, way. not at all. All right, who else uh, this weekend? Well, I mean, I mean we got to wait and see who all gets here. Well, the, the, uh, probably the – I mean, we've rattled off the, the Morvin Josephs and the Javon Banks. The does does Lenneth Whitehead make it in? I was I mean, going to say, Lenneth has got to be the, the, the biggest name on the board just because, it, you know, Tennessee's hoping to get some good news from him uh, as soon as next week. It possibly could go into signing day. But if he comes to campus, I think the writing's on the wall right there, AP, right? Yeah, uh, it you feels know, like Tennessee if he comes up. For yeah, agreed. I mean, it just okay. it feels like they've got all the momentum there, and uh, you know, again, you know, South Carolina's been you know heavily involved there for a while, but that recent official visit where the offensive staff didn't talk to him at all was real eye opener for him, and because uh, he definitely wants to play offense. That's what yes, he wants, the he wants to play. play. He wants the opportunity to play running back. All right, so we'll who all comes in. We'll, we'll note on Saturday. Oh, Beckwith might be here. Yeah, D. Beckwith, and and he's kind of he's on that guy. He's on the board, much like the Georgia kid, much like even really Ramon Henderson. As much as Tennessee may like him, Jimmy Holiday, they may they may all be in that camp of all right. When you fill up at defensive line, if you land Big O and Tyler and you know Oxendine, Whitehead, again, you start doing the math. 
Right. So, There's going to be there may be a spot for one of these playmakers, well, and it's kind of which one does Tennessee want, or which one is willing to jump in when Tennessee. See, wants. I think Tennessee really wants Jimmy Holiday a lot. You know, because sure. because he can play quarterback, is an athlete that could play other positions. He wants the chance to play quarterback. You know, so I think Tennessee would would love to give him the opportunity to be on this football team. And so I think Tennessee likes him a lot. I don't. I do not think he is behind any kind of pecking order. I'm not saying he's at the top of pecking order. I'm just saying, I don't think that like. To me, there are certain guys that are ahead of other guys at other positions. I don't with him. If he wants to come, I think there'll be a spot for him. Okay. It's an interesting pitch though, too, for Tennessee because they could be looking at a quarterback room that's actually pretty stout in the spring. A hundred percent. Yeah. And no then you probably likely have a lot of movement after I mean, that. I'm not. I'm not it, it, I just go just, back to the fact that I just don't think it was, it was my my thought process before they ever went you know, to hell and back with with the quarterback room this year. I always thought Shrout was likely to leave. Mauer feels good enough about his spot. He'll be here. Uh, at this point, I think Jarrett's here. But, I mean, again, who knows? I mean, maybe some, you know, maybe a, a bigger, you know, um, maybe a bigger opportunity comes Jarrett's way somewhere else and he decides to grant transfer. There's no guarantee that he'll be back. I just think it just lends itself, and that's why I've thought this for the last couple of weeks, it lends itself to him coming back. Yeah, I mean. And, just, and, and, again, we said this before, you know, when we all made the kind of comments in the GQ's, you know, you know, oh, is it going pro? Her, her, her. You know, the whole point was if in Jarrett's mind, Jarrett planned on having a really good year and would have the opportunity to have a you know possibly make the decision to go pro. I always said the best thing that could happen for Tennessee is he has a good year, not a great year, and he's forced to come back, which lets Harrison Bailey mature. Because again, Harrison Bailey six months into the program and Harrison Munt, Bailey 18 months into the program were two different guys. It's hard to, it's, it would be hard to see Jared if he, if he's comfortable with, you know, getting through everything he's been through to want to go play in another offense his fourth and four years. I mean, it just, it would make sense for him to come back given where he's at right now if he finishes this thing off on Saturday. So we'll see how all that plays out. Uh, Tennessee basketball team is in uh, Destin or just north of Destin. At the, did Steve Forbes get that gym named after him, not, Rob? No, but – No, I mean, he should have, right? Should they, have. They, they nearly, two, nearly won a national title two, in the JUCO ranks. Two national title appearances. Right. So, anyway, they're playing in Steve Forbes' old house, old gym down in the JUCO ranks. Um, in, in what should be a pretty good atmosphere, sold-out deal, Florida State's in yeah, town. tickets are hard to come. They are I, hard. I've had several people asking me about yeah. it. And part of it's probably, you know, Tallahassee's right down the road. But right. And a little gym. I mean, you know, they're not playing in some – 2,500. You know, so, it should be, should be fun that way. But a real challenging weekend for Tennessee. What, what do you think Tennessee's going to learn about themselves well, I mean, this weekend, win or lose? I mean, I, I think the size that they'll see from Florida State is the biggest thing that, you know, jumps out at me in that first matchup. And, um, you know, pre- if if they make it to Saturday, either Purdue, either Purdue or VCU, much different team, much different Purdue team this year than they were a year ago. But uh, I think Florida State, you know, I know VCU's ranked and they beat LSU, but for me, Florida State, with, just with the size that they bring in the paint, that that's the biggest challenge that that I think they'll see, and I think they'll find out, you know, how how Eves is going to do down in, on the blocks against a you know legit ACC size. You know, is Fulgerson going to hold up? Is he going to get shoved around? And um, you know, it was kind of a minor detail from Tuesday's game or Monday's game, excuse me. But they're going to have to have the guards rebound like they did that night. I mean, Jordan Bowden and Josiah James combined for 20, 22, 23 rebounds. They both had double digits. So that's going to happen. You know, I don't expect them to get twenty plus every night, but both of those guys are going to have to get on the glass. Is this the weekend? Two things. Is this the weekend where um, Rick Barnes truly finds out about his bench because he has to play him? And two, is this the weekend where? Maybe you see Josiah James with the ball in his hand at the point because I can't, I, I don't see Lamonte Turner playing 38 Friday night and 38 on Saturday. Yeah, I don't either. I mean, I, I would, I would have to think that you, that you know, Rick's have to start experimenting with that a little bit more, and you know, to do that, he's also going to have to get into his bench some because you know, to if if Lamont, if Josiah's got the ball, Lamonte's on the bench, and you know, somebody's you got to play you know either Jalen or or Devonte Gaines or or Pember, and Pember's a guy that I think Rick's really. Hoping to come on, trying to push, push a little bit. Push. He uh, he's been getting some personal attention from from Coach Barnes here lately, to the point where he's got him on a he's got him on a shot regimen. He's got to make five hundred threes every day, in their uh, and and Drew's Drew's kind of embracing it. Now I'm not I'm not saying he's going to have a breakout weekend right, right now, but I I think just for the guys that are playing a little bit and, and giving them a little bit of something, I, I think Timber is the one that that Rick thinks has got 
you know, a, a lot more, a, a, a ceiling he can get to that maybe the others don't. What, what do we make of uh, Tom Satkoviak's tweet about Eurosh? Getting I mean, to travel? Getting to be able to travel. No, it just, there's nothing there. Just, you know, tra transfers can't travel with the team, unlike just a normal red shirt. So, I mean, so Rick felt really bad for the kids when they went to, when they went to Toronto and kind of, you know, had to, had to leave him here like Macaulay Calkin in Home Alone. <laughs> and, and especially, he was especially concerned about it with it being Thanksgiving. The holidays, you know, and him, you know, him and Victor Bailey both, you know, here on an empty campus. So that was, uh, that was at the root. He he really pushed hard for that. But but that doesn't doesn't have any bearing on no because Bailey got it too. So I mean, that, okay. That's been so done. this is just a hey, this is take care of us on this deal here because it's winter break. They're going to be here all, all winter long. You know, we got a couple of road games coming up. But they're know. not. But the, but they've still not ruled on the second appeal, correct? No, but I mean, again, I mean, it's, uh, somebody told me the other day that there were still like more than four hundred cases pending. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? The NCAA has got four hundred appeal cases. That they, I mean, it, it could be February before. Yeah, you I mean, get and to again, I've not. I mean, I've talked with a lot of people about it, and I've not gotten any sense of optimism. No, nobody, nobody has no. a feel. Nobody. That, I mean, nobody said, "Oh, there's, you know, it's just absolutely over." You know, we hope so. We're not expecting good news. Right. We're trying, but nobody's expecting anything there. So, plenty with the basketball team this weekend. Interesting test uh, for this team this weekend. Um, how will they, you know, perform, and how will they play in this environment, and how will they play against the size, as Rob mentioned there. So we'll have coverage from that this weekend. I want to jump back to the bowl situation a little bit for Tennessee. It is if if Tennessee wins, are they a lock for Florida? I don't want to say they're a lock for anything because I mean, like you know, the, the way they do it now, I don't think you can say for sure that they're a lock. It's not like the old days because the conference office divvies this, divvies this thing out because. Charlotte, Nashville, Tampa, Jacksonville, they're all viewed the same. But I do think they still lend itself to listening to the bowls. So I, I do think that Tennessee likely ends up in Jacksonville with the outside shot of I actually so I agree with everything that AP just said. I think if Alabama wins at Auburn and Tennessee wins Saturday, I think Tennessee's a lot. Because I think if that happens, then you're Georgia's the gonna beat Georgia Georgia Tech, Florida's gonna beat Florida State. So those are formalities. And so even no matter what happens in the SEC championship game, Georgia, Alabama, and Florida will all be New Year's Six teams at minimum. Plus LSU? At minimum, So you're yes. saying four teams will be. So they're going to get four that way. And, that, and if that ha if, so to me, it's going to come down to does, does Alabama win at Auburn? Yeah, because if Alabama wins. If Alabama loses, I don't think they're going to slide. They won't slide out, but Florida could end up getting bumped back where Florida does not get to a New Year's Six so game. So Florida could end up being in the Outback Bowl, or they could be in Orlando. In the Citrus. Yeah, I think they'd be in the like Citrus. Like Florida-Auburn would be the Tampa-Orlando deal. And, and then A&M played in the Tax Slayer Bowl last year, which lends itself to thinking they're not going to go back-to-back, -back, even though that occasionally happens. And that Texas Bowl really wants A&M pretty bad because I think they want to match up Texas and Texas A&M. Well, and you've also got a Texas A&M team that's, look, I think they're going to lose to LSU, so they're going to be coming off two losses. They're going to be limping in as a seven-win football team, whereas Tennessee is trending upward. I mean, I think, I think when you look at it, I, I get Auburn at, even at eight and four, Florida obviously, but I think once you get past... Well, see, I think, see, that, that's the whole thing is that if, if Alabama, if, if, if the SEC gets the four teams in the New Year's Six, the Citrus are going to take Auburn. Right. They're the best team. They're going to take Auburn. And so then it's Tennessee has a sh is going to either go to Jacksonville or to Tampa. Or Tampa. And I can, you could honestly actually see them go to Tampa um, because Kentucky may want to – Jacksonville may want to grab Kentucky. They had them two years ago, though. So, I mean, like – But I guess my point is I, I see Tennessee as a better bowl option than – for, for a bowl, is a better option for a bowl than Kentucky or Texas A&M. I, I think you look at it. Agreed. You got Alabama, you got Georgia, you got uh, LSU, Florida, Auburn as the five, quote, better teams in the SEC for a bowl. And then I think Tennessee set six. I would agree. I agree with that. I mean, I, I don't think anybody else behind them who's going to be bowl eligible would set ahead of Tennessee. And Tennessee's going to sell some tickets. Yeah. And, I mean, Big you, you got to think Tennessee fans are going to be excited. You know, that they're on a winning trick, that they're going to get some exposure and some publicity. They would make the most sense. So Tennessee, Tennessee, the team, Jeremy Pruitt, those guys, they might not like this, may not like this matchup. But some of the uh, folks out there that are the bowl experts, you know, have put out the Tennessee, Michigan, and Tampa. That'd be a pretty fascinating game because 
you know, Michigan's been playing really well. We don't know what's going to happen and it would be against Ohio State, but I mean, they've been on fire the last couple, you know, the last few weeks. Mm -hmm. That'd be a heck of a matchup for Tennessee. And Shea Patterson versus Jarrett Garrett. And then the two buddies would get to showdown. Yeah. A little showdown. A little showdown. Two buddies and Jim Harbaugh. Here's what I'm saying. Tennessee, but I think that Tennessee and the fans would probably say, hey, let's just go beat the hell out of Iowa. (laughs) (laughs) We'll go to the other side of the state. Yeah. We'll go to the other side of the state. (laughs) Probably. I'll say this. If, if, what Jesse said plays out, and you get the four in the New Year's six. That would mean the team that you know Tennessee would be battling it out for down there really would be it'd be like A and M, Auburn, Kentucky, and 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 Tennessee. In their rule, I'm pretty sure there's a rule in place like you just have to be within one game right. of a team, right. which means Tennessee could technically get picked by Orlando. Quit stop! Let's stop worrying. Stop trying to get yourself to Disneyland. I don't think Tennessee's going to. It's get Disney World. Over. It's Disney World. I, I, dude, I don't go there between Christmas and New Year's, man. That's just dumb. I'm just saying, like, I do think that that's possible based off of rules. If yeah, what I Jesse d- said plays out is correct, with those four teams being in the New Year's six, Auburn would be eight and four, and then Tennessee. A and M and Kentucky would all be Auburn seven and five. Still too. Yeah, I think Auburn will try. But you're right. I mean, technically it could be. But see, but see, Auburn's been to Orlando. Tennessee, Orlando's not had Tennessee in nearly 20 years. Would there be an appeal there, knowing the fans show up, knowing that they technically could take them, knowing they've not had them in 20 years? I'm just devil, devil's advocate. I think I think the committee in the Citrus Bowl. Whatever the bowl, whatever it's called now, it used to be the comp USA. It's going to want an eight and four team over seventy-five teams. I think Austin's teams. diet wants the wants the Outback Steakhouse and the Bloomin' Onions. I, I think I think what it. I don't do onions. Man. I think what it is is I think they're going to want a ranked Auburn team. With with a little more publicity. I'm just saying, based off rules, guy. you can't I, rule it out. I know. That's I agree. With that, but but I haven't. I've just not heard Tennessee's name with that bowl. They, they, I don't know that they've been around to see Tennessee. But I don't know if he, how many people have had four teams in the New Year's Six. You know, I'm just saying, if Jet, to me, like, yeah. I've, I've not heard really many people me, mention Auburn in the, or not Auburn, but Florida in the New Year's Six. Most people have Florida locked into Orlando, yeah, everything well, I've seen. I, 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 you know, I think there's a chance as a 10 win team they could get in New Year's Six. If, if, ten, if the SEC only gets three as we wrap it up here, is, is, then, then Tennessee would be what? Jacksonville and. Possibly Tampa. Still Tampa. Still so, you st- Tampa. so you still think they're going to go to Florida? I, I still do, yeah. You think still they're do. in Florida? Even if, even if the pl- SEC only gets three teams. Yes, part of the Part of the domino with Florida, though, is because, all, is because Oregon lost. That's, that's how the domino yeah. has changed this week, because Oregon has no shot now, so they are penciled into either they will be out or they're like out of the New Year's Six or they're going to be playing in the Rose Bowl because Utah could either be in the playoffs or be playing in the Rose Bowl. Yeah, what? Who, who do you? Who, I don't, and I've not paid enough attention to the, the projections. Who's been projected to to Charlotte? I mean, there's some chance that some of those bowls are not going to get SEC it's teams. Close. I mean, I, there's a real chance Nashville doesn't get an SEC team this year. Yeah, the first, the couple ones that I've yeah. seen that that it does, it looked like they're going to be like UCF and some of those teams maybe playing in, in uh, Birmingham or. Uh, yeah, because Memphis. Yeah, because the SEC is not going to fill their allotment. So maybe Kentucky o- over there potentially. Yeah, Kentucky Charlotte. and Charlotte would make some you sense. Know, yeah. Um, so we'll see how how it plays out. Obviously, Tennessee's got to get to seven and take care of their business on Saturday against the Vanderbilt team that's limping coming in. So can the Vols take care of business and get it done the way that they should against this team? That's going to do it for this Friday edition of the VolQuest.com podcast. Hope you've enjoyed this while your wife's out shopping on Black Friday. Uh, for Rob Lewis. Austin Price, Jesse Simpton, I'm Brent Hubbs. Enjoy the rest of your Friday, everybody.